Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the United States Army Heritage and Education Center's Army Heritage Trail for our spring field trip program. The Army Heritage Trail serves as the USAHEC's outdoor museum and covers about one mile, highlighting nearly every era of Army history with different exhibits and large artifacts. Designed to provide an immersive experience that allows students to walk in each period of Army history, the trail also serves as a stage for our living history presentations. The Allied Expeditionary Force Trenches exhibit is a general representation of several of the types of trenches American soldiers encountered during their time in Europe during World War I. As you walk through the trench, many of the features of the defensive fortification are on display to present the daily experiences of doughboys during the war. Hello, I'm Corporal Tristan Holly of the United States Army, and I'm here on the Heritage Trail to show you around the World War I Trench. Now, can anyone tell me when World War I started? If you said 1914, you're correct. But also, if you said 1917, you'd be correct because the United States entered World War I in 1917, in the month of April. And it didn't take until 1918 that we actually got over there to start fighting. Now, there are a few reasons the United States entered the war, it initially began in 1914 in Europe between other countries because of an assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. But the United States was trying to be isolated and stay out of wars in Europe at the time. So it took a number of things including the sinking of an ocean liner, the Lusitania, which a lot of American civilians perished on, and the Zimmerman telegram where Germany tried to get Mexico to attack the United States. But a number of reasons added up to us joining the war effort and we actually came over and helped England and France sway the tide and take over the central powers that included Germany, Austria, and Turkey. As I mentioned before, I'm Corporal Holly. I've been in the Army a few years since before the war started. In fact, I was in when we were still chasing Pancho Villa across the Mexican border. But uh, then in uh, 1917 they shipped us over for some training and I've been here in France for just over six months now and uh, trench life you know it's not great but you're equipped for it the army makes sure of that so you can tell by what I'm wearing we'll start with my trench boots you can see the hobnails there nice clicking sound and that was to make the tread last longer in your boots for all the marching and walking through the mud and then uh, working my way up my whole uniform is wool everything's wool it was a, a cheap plentiful material and it keeps you warm throughout the whole year and then uh, most of my gear is made of canvas. So uh, my web belt here holds my ammunition in these pouches. My canteen, pretty recognizable there. And then over here I have a first aid kit. Every soldier would have a first aid kit for gunshot wounds that they sustain themselves. And then up here, one of the most important things they'd carry during this war was the gas mask because this was infamous for having gas attacks and you only had a few seconds to get this mask out of here and put it on to possibly save your life or eyesight and so forth and then uh, also I have on my head my steel pot now this was actually uh, the first war that any nation was starting to wear metal helmets you know since the medieval times when we had knights on horses so this is a copy of what the British was wearing because the United States had no idea where to start so we just looked at them and thought it was a good design so the steel pot mainly protects you from shell fragments of artillery and anything coming down from above because as you can see it basically just sits on your head it's not like your modern helmets that give you a little more protection all around and then of course I have my weapons I have a sidearm being a corporal I could be assistant squad leader and I would be in charge of a whole squad 10 to 12 men and uh, or I could be on a gun team a machine gun and they would carry sidearms too because if you get overrun you might have to react quickly with a smaller weapon in the trenches so why don't you follow me over to the aid station? Now we're approaching the aid station through a secondary trench line, so we're a little farther from the front line, it's safer back here. And that is where we'd set up the aid station to protect our wounded, our casualties. So in there is where they could operate, do small surgeries, and everything they can on the front lines to help save soldiers. But first aid was very important in World War I. We had a lot of medical innovations. We were still working on 
antibiotics and stuff to fight infection, but one of the biggest wounds was actually a facial wound from sticking your head over the trenches. So they do what they can back here to stop bleeding and get bandages on before they could send them back to a hospital for more extensive treatment. So down here on the blankets show a few items that a medic would carry here in the field in the trenches. So at the front here we have your first aid kit that every man carried, had a single sterile bandage inside. This would be for wound identification tags. He would put one on each soldier to tell the next doctor exactly what had happened to that soldier to help him treat him. In here you could fit larger bandages or multiples and it was just a bigger pouch for holding more materials that he would use. And then we have things that were sent home or sent from home from uh, through the Red Cross to their soldiers. We would have socks, care packages, we have some scarves, um, sewing kits to repair their uniforms, handkerchiefs, and uh, of course the medic would have his easily identifiable armband from the Red Cross so that combatants would know that he was there to help and not to fight. <clears throat> and then of course the hygiene and health of his soldiers unrelated from wounds is very important so keeping their teeth in good shape is one of the best things to keep your soldier able to fight. And then of course whatever hygiene you can do in a trench involve the soap and trying to clean. And every medic carried a large knife. It was meant for cutting clothing and gear off of soldiers if they had to access their wound. It wasn't necessarily for fighting off an enemy soldier. <clears throat> and this is a salinometer that was to test water to see how how um sanitary it was to drink because that was a hard thing to find so this would this would check for salt content in your water because keeping a soldier healthy would involve clean water if you had bad water that wouldn't keep you up in the fight as we move forward to the front lines I'm going to take you along and you'll notice along the top of the wall we have telephone wire now back in World War I, they didn't have radios that were wireless yet, so to communicate, they'd have all these wires leading to the headquarters building where they would have the radios and telephones. And these would be interconnected among all the bunkers so that the officers could keep control and planning and know what's going on throughout their entire front line. So in the officer's bunker, the HQ, we would have the high-ranking officers that would be planning and coordinating the next battle and maintaining their their units to keep them supplied and fit and ready for the next engagement. So in here you would see the, the officers bunks along with the uh, typewriters that they used to type up reports because we didn't have computers a hundred years ago and then they would also have their radios and telephones. So leading on then you can see we're walking on some nice solid duck boards. However, they weren't too common, but the rats were. There would be literally hundreds of rats throughout these trenches if this was actually the front lines in France. But today, thankfully, our feet are dry, our boots are clean, because we've got these nice duck boards. Now, as we get closer to the front line, you want to keep your head down. This part of the trench is a little short, and incoming artillery could hit you if you don't keep your head down. Now before we get to the front, let's take a pause and I'm going to show you more of what the soldiers carried in all their gear. So I showed you my uniform before and on my back here I have the full pack as a soldier would be wearing it in the trenches and in the field. So soldier literally carried everything he owned on his back when he's out here in the trenches. But down here on the blanket, we have it all laid out as a display so you can see exactly what he carried on his person. So first up, one of the most important things, this is an original gas mask from World War I. So you would have your mask and the hose leading to the filter inside the pack there. And you had to wear it up close to your face because that hose wasn't very long. And then we have his T-handle shovel. Each soldier would carry an individual entrenching tool and that would be used for digging foxholes or fixing the trench walls as it was needed. He has some spare clothing, a uh, wool shirt, wasn't very uh, friendly on the skin though. And then an extra pair of socks and laces of course because you never know when one would rip and then you'd be unprepared so they had to carry extras. 
Down here we have his hygiene kit. Like I said, hygiene was very important and difficult, but we would have soap, we would have shaving <clears throat> things for keeping his, his face clean and representable. The officers would still be very strict on keeping your face shaven and clean even though you were in the trenches. And of course your mirror would come important for that. And you could also use the mirror for signaling aircraft or looking around corners. And then we have his gear. The web belt would carry your ammunition. We mentioned the first aid kit. Up here in the center of the pack would be all his food. So these are your ration items. This is called your condiment tin. It opens on both ends and you would have your condiments in there like salt and pepper and other important things for keeping your food somewhat flavorful. Because the rations, even though it says beef and vegetable, probably didn't taste like much of anything. This tin is called your bacon tin. You would put dried meats or anything else you could put in there. It was nice and sturdy to keep things from getting smashed. And this was your hard bread tin. So in there they'd literally have hard bread or crackers would be more recognizable to what you eat today. And that stuff was uh, baked and treated so that it would last longer in the field and wouldn't get um, start to perish. And over here we have your canteen. Some of you may recognize this from going camping. But it would have a cup, canteen, this one belonged to Joe, and that would all fit together and go inside your pouch. And the cup was used for many different things besides just drinking water. Since it's a tin cup, you could put your beef and vegetables in the cup and cook it over a small flame to make it somewhat more desirable. And up here would be your mess kit. You can do the same thing. If you don't have one or the other, you can improvise and use one for the other purpose. And of course your silverware for eating. And that all fit in the pouch on the outside. And then if you're going on a long march, this was your pack roll. Inside it has a blanket rolled up and on the outside is a shelter half. Now it was only a half because each soldier would pair up and put together a pup tent. So each soldier carried one pole and four pegs and one half. And they were interchangeable and you could just match them up and camp for the night in your pup tent. And then this all rolls up and fits on your back. And it's a little heavy, but the soldiers were trained and physically ready and they were able to carry this wherever they had to go. Which includes the front lines and that's where we're heading next. As we move forward to the front, I have to stop and mention that it wasn't all action or excitement for the soldiers. There was a lot of downtime and in fact to keep them from getting bored, they had to come up with ways to keep entertained. So here we can see a few items that could have been sent from home. The first is a camera, that is a period photograph camera that uh, soldiers could bring. They would be private purchase of course, the army didn't give them cameras. And then if they had a chance they'd take pictures of their friends or get their friends to take a picture of them to send home to their loved ones. And then of course the bugler cigarette case, tobacco was as important as it is today to a soldier. And then we'd have playing cards. Everyone can recognize them, a good way to keep a soldier entertained. Most people knew how to play a game of steamboats in World War I. And the uh, New Testament, the army did actually give them to soldiers if they asked for a New Testament, because that would bring source of comfort to some soldiers on the front lines. And of course, writing home. They didn't have those real easy to use click pens back then. They mostly used the inkwell and a quill pen to write home. And then we have their training manuals. If they have downtime, they were encouraged to always brush up on their training. Now we have several different manuals because they were always getting updated with newly acquired tactics and techniques for warfare. Because the army is ever evolving and learning and finding ways to improve. And then the Army Navy service book would be another source of songs and prayers and things to help the soldier feel comfort on his way to the front. So beyond the front line, you'll see No Man's Land. No Man's Land consisted mainly of debris from previous battles and shell craters and lots of barbed wire. <clears throat> 
Now it was no man's land because no man could either survive or want to be out there most of the time. So it was nicknamed no man's land because that's where no man would be found unless they were attacking or defending in a battle. So up here at the front lines, you'd have to keep your head down most of the time because you never know when a shell is going to land near you and that's why we have our steel pot to protect us from those shrapnel fragments. Shrapnel is a piece of that shell casing, a metal fragment flying through the air and it's intended to either destroy objects or bunkers and trenches or to maim and injure a soldier of the enemy. So up here on the front lines, soldiers would be relaxing, they'd be reloading their ammunition which came up in ammo boxes as you see here and they'd be anticipating the next call or whistle blow to go over the top. That was the moment every soldier dreaded but that was the reason they were all here. So as their squad leader, their corporal, I might be in charge and have a whistle. We'd coordinate a time for the attack and as soon as they heard this whistle blast that meant it was time to go. And on the blast, they'd be yelled to charge over the top. Get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Johnny, show the hun, you're a son of the sun. Hoist the flag and let her fly. Yankee doodle do or die. Pack your little kit, show your grip, do your bit. Yankees do the rank from the top.